Hi, I'm Del Tackett. I'm excited to be your host on this live stream broadcast by Logos Research Associates. Logos Research Associates is a fellowship. It's a fellowship of scientists and scholars who are committed to a high view of scripture and science. And that's why I'm doing this. We believe that a true and honest look at the world around us will confirm what God has told us uh, about not only the origins of the universe and the earth and life itself, but it will also confirm what he has told us about himself and about who we are and our relationship to him. I have a quote from uh, one of my favorite scientists here. I want to read it to you from Johannes Kepler. This is what he said about science. The chief aim of all in the the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and harmony which has been imposed on it by God. The chief and, uh, aim, the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order and the harmony which has been imposed on it by God. This of course, is radically different from the current scientific paradigm that we're all familiar with. It's That is based upon a philosophy of naturalism. And what this means is that the current secular model of science cannot allow any evidence that points to something outside of the natural box. But we believe that God has not only created the world we live in, but the exquisite complexity of all creation actually points us to him. We read this in, in Romans. Uh, Paul is writing, that which is known about God is evident within them. So it's evident within us. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. So we believe that a biblical approach to science actually provides a better view of the world around us because we're not put in the chains of naturalism. If we see divine cause in the world around us, we can acknowledge that. A secular scientist is not allowed to do that. So Logos Research Associates is providing this live stream as well as uh, the others, and I encourage you to, to look at the ones that have been recorded so that you can hear from credible scientists and scholars who believe that there is a wealth of evidence around us that confirms the historical narrative of Genesis as well as the rest of God's Word. And with that, let us begin by asking God to bless our time. Father, we do come before you and pray that tonight would be honoring to you, uh, that it would bring glory to you, to your name. Uh, we pray uh, that uh, you would provide clarity. We ask for doc Dr. Austin that you would give him clarity in his thought and clarity in his mind. Uh, and also, Father, for our viewers, that, Lord, you would allow us the privilege to hear and to see you as, as we hear these things, that our mind would be drawn back uh, to you and to your glory. For all of this, Father, is for your glory. And we thank you uh, because of the redemption that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I have the privilege now to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Austin and Derry Stansberry. Uh, these are short bios, and believe me, they are short. Uh, they could go on for a long time in terms of the credentials that they have. Dr. Uh, Stephen A. Austin has a PhD degree in sedimentary geology from Pennsylvania State University and now serves as an adjunct faculty at Cedarville University and project researcher with Logos Research Associates. He has specialized in catastrophic sedimentary process modeling with specific application to strata of Grand Canyon. His 35 year investigation of a single fossil bearing stratum within the Redwall limestone has allowed him to camp uh, two years of his life below the rim of Grand Canyon. He is author of three books and more than a hundred technical geological papers. His wife is Dr. Kelly Austin, professor of pediatric surgery at Children's Hospital, 
the University of Pittsburgh. I'm also going to read the bio of uh, Derry Stansbury. You will see him uh, a little bit later. He has a Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Engineering uh, from the Colorado School of Mines. He has a Master of Science in Geology from the Institute for Creation Research. He's currently a research associate here at Logos. His current research is on the sediment gravity flow in the Texas Panhandle. Our topic is, as you saw earlier on the slide, understanding a, a gigantic mass kill fossil deposit within the Redwall Limestone of Grand Canyon. And that is exciting to me because Dr. Austin took me on a little hike, well, little, uh, a little hike <laughs> to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And he showed me some of the nonoid fossils that he had been studying for so many years. It was a fascinating trip. And I'm sure you're going to be fascinated uh, by the things he has to share with us uh, tonight. Things that I believe have huge implications to the modern view of geological science. So, uh, Stephen Darius, it's a blessing for me to be with you both. Welcome. But first, let me ask you to explain to our viewers just what kind of geologist you are. Even though, uh, Dr. Austin, you have studied the nautiloid fossils extensively, uh, you are not a paleontologist, are you? No, I'm a, I'm a physical process geologist. In other words, I study physical process, not biological process. And okay. uh, But biology is not, um, and paleontology are not foreign subjects. I'm just more interested in fossils and sedimentary objects rather than once living things. Well, I, I'm sure that uh, you know a whole lot more even about paleontology than most of us, uh, even though that's not your specialty. But I can tell you and tell all our viewers here that uh, being with you has always been a fascinating thing for me. Uh, you and I were at Mount St. Helens. Uh, we've been down the Grand Canyon. Uh, we've been in a helicopter uh, flying over the Grand Canyon. And uh, so it's exciting for me uh, to have you here tonight. And uh, for what uh, we're going to be talking about, because I think that is going to be fascinating for people. So let me turn it over to you and uh, let you begin uh, to uh, tell us what you have for us tonight. Well, let's uh, uh, let's talk an overview of what we're going to be talking about. And then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go through the content and then we'll come to conclusions at the end. Uh, but the overview... Okay. Um, you know, geologists expect to find certain things, right? And we have expectations. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we can talk about extremely persistent stratum. And then we can talk about what's inside the stratum, the one in Grand Canyon. And uh, then I'll talk about a model, a flow model called liquefied sediment flow model. And then I'm gonna talk about the implications with a little bit with dairy um, supplementing me and then uh, minutes, not millions of years. Uh, kind of a conclusion to what we're talking about. Okay, Steve, uh, I think what you're gonna to need to do is hit escape uh, and then start the PowerPoint again so that we can have it up for folks. There we go. Okay, uh, from current slide. Yep. Is that it? Yeah, there we have the overview that you uh, just went through. So good, we're on track. Okay, you didn't see the overview before, is that right? Okay. That's uh, well, that's uh, what jealous expect to find, extremely persistent strata, what's inside the stratum, liquefied sediment flow model, implications which are really far reaching and then minutes not millions of years in the kind of summary expectations what do you expect when you're looking at the red wall limestone well if you talk to geologists and geologists have been studying grand canyon uh, red wall limestone for now 150 years they expect to see the the Redwall limestone was deposited in a calm and placid ocean. That's kind of the, uh, yeah, and the as the oceans came and went repeatedly over the continent, they made the 
the limestone strata, the shale strata, and the sandstone strata very rapidly. What is the average red wall sedimentation rate? Well, if you uh, if you go to Wikipedia, they'll tell you what uh, the Mississippian period is. It's uh, 35.7 million years in duration. And uh, we have the Pennsylvanian uh, Supai on top of the red wall, and we have the Devonian Temple Butte underneath. So the there's the there's the Mississippian, the red wall, Mississippian red wall, th- supposedly deposited over 35.7 million years, and it's 490 feet thick, which is 5,880 inches thick. And so you divide millions of 35 million years by 5,880, and you come up with a colossal uh, rate of 6,000 years per inch. Hmm. That's the average rate of sedimentation in the classical way of thinking about red wall limestone, 6,000 years per inch. So the standard and, paradigm would, so the standard paradigm would say that the sediment, the rate of sediment uh, collection in this placid ocean uh, is, is uh, one inch for 6,000 years. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One inch in 6,000 years. And um, there are places in the Bahama banks where ca- carbonate sediment is accumulating. And uh, that's what they think the rate of accumulation is something like 6,000 years per inch. So uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, that's the way uh, people think about it. And um, Dave Strom, a petroleum geologist in Bakersfield, California, uh, was talking and he said, Steve, you're doing uh, some wonderful work on granular flows at Mount St. Helens. And he even had some good work on the application of those granular sediment flows to the Tapete Sandstone of Grand Canyon. Nice compliment. Okay. But then he said, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> don't you ever think about applying what you have seen at Mount St. Helens to the red wall limestone of Grand Canyon, because there's <laughs> proof positive of millions of years. And I took it as a compliment and then a challenge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to talk about those extremely persistent stratum. And Dell, you want me to um, the yeah, lateral? Let me, let me, Go ahead. Yeah, let's add just uh, just for people to understand here when you're using uh, the word here persistent so, and extremist, so it's extremely persistent. What does that What does that mean? That means to me that it's extremely persistent horizontally, all okay. around through the earth. And um, you'll see that, uh, how that, how I concluded those things in a minute. But I've watched this stratum right here. You see it. Let me see if I can bring up my uh, laser pen. There you see it. It's seven feet in thickness right there. And it is uh, rather massive. And then you see on top of it, thinly laminated chert and limestone. And underneath it, you see a finer texture uh, limestone. And this sequence of strata is laterally persistent over a colossal area. And the lateral persistence really impressed me. Over now 36 years of uh, studying this bed in Grand Canyon. I've been tracking it from my initial sighting at Nautiloid Canyon. That's location number one in Marble Canyon, upstream from the main Grand Canyon area. Okay, there. I've tracked it through the Grand Canyon over 100 miles, out 160 miles out to next to Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, on Frenchman Mountain. 
eye level with the Stratosphere Hotel. Hmm. Um, and I've seen the bed almost continuously two meters thick underneath the, the thin bedded chert and limestone above the normal limestone layers underneath it. And I've seen it in many places, things like places I remember the type section with the overlying uh, Thunder Springs uh, member, the type section of, of the Whitmore wash member. And because it's a uh, bed in the Whitmore wash member, we call it the Whitmore nautiloid bed. Uh, Jeff Canyon, the Wallapai tribe area in Western Grand Canyon. I've seen it on especially prominent on Azure Ridge in uh, the Lake Mead area. And then, of course, over in uh, the, the mountains east, just directly east of Las Vegas uh, mm -hmm. on Las Vegas uh, <laughs> Boulevard, um, uh, Lake Mead Boulevard. I've seen it out there. So that's the uh, it's a colossal area. And I've seen it over enough times to believe in its persistence. I've, I've drawn pictures of thousands of nautiloids, these fossils I've found in it and other things, and uh, it is colossal and um, mm. very persistent. This is my favorite image of it. Um, here you see the thin bedded chert and limestone above. You see the seven foot thickness of this more massive bed. And then you see the thinner bedded uh, uh, red wall limestone underneath it. But anyway, that's fascinated me. And what, what I noticed was thick uh, uh, and football sized coral heads in the middle of the bed of the limestone and nautiloid fossils, large fossils, some of them six feet in length in the mm. center of that bed. And uh, how did things get in the center of the bed, you know? And there's a lot of challenging things to look for. The other thing I saw was vertical pipe-like structures that I think of as fluid escape pipes. And uh, so these things are very diagnostic of, of uh, this one layer. And uh, it's a slam dunk. It's very persistent, extremely hmm. persistent in the Grand Canyon. Okay, I've talked to you about, mentioned the word nautiloid. What is a nautiloid? A nautiloid is a marine creature resembling a squid, which had a solid chambered shell. And these are the and ones that are all, as long as your arm, right? Yeah, they're about the length of your arm on the average. And some of them up to six feet. Some of them are rather small, but uh, they're all different sizes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it leads me to this diagram of the Whitmore nautiloid bed. There's the, the seven foot thick bed there in uh, the diagram. And you see my drawing of the nautiloid fossils, the coral heads and other marine uh, creatures in the, uh, the bed. And then you see these vertical water escape pipes that I interpret water escape pipe, vertical uh, tubes essentially through the deposit. And uh, that's the characteristic of the nautiloid bed, Whitmore nautiloid bed. <clears throat> and in it, you see these very beautifully preserved nautiloid fossils. Here's the body cavity chamber of a very well-preserved nautiloid. Then you see the septa of the shell. And then you see the pointy end with the cameral calcite deposits that the organism used to weight down its tip hmm. so it could could um, uh, basically forage on the bottom. We think it's a bottom feeding kind of squid-like organism. What are these over here? Look at this. All around the fossil, you see these uh, pock marks look like uh, lighter colored circles. I've, I've uh, doused the, the, the nautiloid in water so it's more contrasty, but you see these... Uh, these little tube-like structures. You're looking down on the bed and you're seeing the nautiloid horizon in the middle and you see almost everywhere 
this modeled appearance of the vertical tube-like structures of the water escape pipes. So those are water escape pipes. And you can see those in the bed itself, the, the top surface of the bed. And then as you look at the side uh, from a cross section, you can see these uh, vertical aligned tubes that uh, are oriented in the uh, across the, the, the layer. And then you can see these, uh, they're about eight or 900 per square meter typically. And so it's a, it's a prominent uh, fabric of the deposit are these water escape tubes or, or uh, fluid escape pipes. Okay, well, uh, I studied the, the nautiloid bed where it has nautiloids. Then I found the bed where it doesn't have nautiloids. And Derry, uh, my graduate student, he did his thesis on the places where the nautiloids were uh, rather rare and uh, like Virgin River Gorge. Starts to get really interesting. Up until now, we've got 140 miles of two seven foot thick bed that's pretty massive and, and consistent. And at Virgin River Gorge, this is really right at the uh, uh, state boundary between Arizona and Nevada. And what we can see here is this is about 13 feet thick. Uh, so it's starting to inflate. So that we've got flow transformation happening now. So for, for the longest time, all through Arizona, northern Arizona, it was a pretty steady seven, seven feet thick bed. And now it's starting to inflate. And so the thesis that I did with Dr. Austin was to describe how does this flow end, how does it transform into, or what does it transform into as the flow ends and changes from that platform facies to this now slope facies uh, bed. And we'll have more uh, things to talk about as we get further west into Nevada. Yeah, notice the thin bedded chert limestone above. Notice the massive bed. It's more grainy than the, the seven foot thick bed. In other words, it has uh, less fine uh, deposits in it. And underneath it, it has uh, a regular limestone. But uh, we're able to follow that into Nevada, and uh, which is really cool. Like, for example, the Mormon Mountains in Clark County, Nevada, uh, on that mountain, you can see the Whitmore nautiloid bed. You want to talk about that one, uh, Derry? Yeah, this one um, has now gone from 12 or 13 feet thick at, at uh, the Virgin River Gorge to some 27 feet thick here. So it's continuing to get thicker um, in just water. And as we start to talk about the hydrodynamics of the flow, we'll see that the character of this flow now is starting to become a little more uh, attractive. It's interacting with the base that the flow is moving on, uh, and it's actually going into deeper water. Some of the equations that we'll talk about in a little bit um, help us define how deep the water was at each of these locations based on how thick the bed was. So we know that now, before, where it was seven feet thick, it was on a one or two degree slope moving on that slope. And now we're starting to see it go down slope a little bit and thicken as it does that. And boy, does it thicken. Uh, take a look at the Las Vegas range. Uh, hill number one is what I call it. And Derry, you did the measurements there. Yeah, it's 45 to 50 foot thick there. And this is actually now a dune structure um, at, at this location. So it's gone from the, the just the flat 15 foot thick or 20 foot thick bed to forming cross beds now. So we've got a whole different flow regime. This is further away from Grand Canyon. And the, trans, the flow has transformed to attractive current now. And it's creating uh, uh, crossbeds in and large sand dunes. The exposure there um, 
is probably a, a dune of some uh, 25 to 30 feet tall uh, in the original dune that was underwater. So very different from what we've been seeing before. Yeah. So the, the character of the strata is changing remarkably. Uh, Hill 2 there in the North Las Vegas range from Google Earth imagery, you can see the uh, the whole layer. And that layer is uh, 45 feet thick, something like that. And it has the chert limestone on top of it, the marker. And then you can see how persistent it is back there going off to the northwest and it dives underground and uh, we got to do some more work to find it in some of the other mountains but uh, isn't that remarkable extremely persistent and now up to 45 feet thick so that leads to this uh, diagram the facies lithofacies model diagram and you can see how I've mapped it. There's uh, Lake Mead and Las Vegas. Here's the Grand Canyon. And there is Page, Arizona and, and Lake Powell. Um, and uh, but the nautiloid bed is th this uh, darker green color is the platform facies of Whitmore nautiloid bed. And that's where nautiloids are very abundant. And uh, that other area, the lighter green, is the area of the thickening of the strata. And uh, we removed the basin and range extension of those strata on the faults and restored it to what we believe is the original position. And as we do the original position and measure the thickness uh, over this area, we estimate over the 10,000 square mile area of this outcropping bed, is that persistent? 10,000 square miles, okay. 10,000 square miles, we have 25 cubic miles of sediment in that layer that we, that we have a, a confidence of having measured and we don't know what's outside that box. So, uh, outside those areas, the boundaries, uh, currently the boundaries unknown. So Derry did his thesis on how does a debris flow end? And do you know what he didn't find? He didn't find the end of the debris yeah. flow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're still, it's so persistent that we're still looking for the end of it. Okay, we keep finding it. Okay. Okay, well, uh, are you interested in what's inside the bed? Yeah, let's look at that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what's inside the bed is amazing. Okay, nautiloid, of course, is that marine fossil uh, resembling a squid, which had a solid chambered shell. And, of course, those nautiloids are a prominent fossil in that layer. Not the only fossil, but the most noteworthy because of size and along with the football size coral heads and uh, with other corals and, and uh, crinoid material that makes the, the fossil content of the bed, especially where it's uh, seven feet thick. And of course it has those water escape pipes, but the nautiloids, here's a diagram of what they might look like, but they're uh, in cross section, you can see what they're like the body cavity right here, the organism had a tube running down through the center and it could pressurize the chambers of the shell mm. and had even siphuncle and uh, cameral calcite deposits providing ballast tip at the tip so it could sink it. And so all the animal needed to do would be to put gas into the chain, into the uh, the chambers of the shell, and that would make it neutrally buoyant, and it could float around in the ocean and swim. Fastest swimming predator, maybe. And some of these things may have been six feet long, most on the average length of your arm, something like that. And uh, so they're um, they're big. And um, Rhinoceros is the name of the genus of the nautiloid that we have been studying. You can see them, of course, uh, very nicely. There's the tip end, 
And then here you see the outcrop in cross section. And you can see the circle at the end of the outcrop. And we don't have the the other end of the organism extending out. We just, uh, you know, it's broken off. So that could be even lo much longer than uh, is ex expressed there. And of course, we have thin ones and the 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 cameral calcite and the ballast at the tip is is uh, kind of interesting. Hmm. You see one out of seven nautiloids are vertical in the bed, pointy end down. See the pointy end? They're down in the, in the layers of the bed. And uh, one out of seven on the average. And I've drawn pictures of thousands of nautiloids. And uh, yeah, one out of seven uh, are in, in vertical orientation, tip end down. Isn't that interesting? No. Uh, and that's something to think about. So uh, Jeff Canyon on the Wallapai tribe area in Western Grand Canyon. Here's a map view of the nautiloid bed at the uh, horizon of the nautiloids. It's, there are 21 nautiloids on nine square meters uh, area. And uh, so uh, this, this, uh, is pretty much typical of uh, the, the outcrop of the nautiloids uh, over the the hundred uh, mile exposure, and uh, See, this, God, there could be billions of nautiloids in there, couldn't there? This is where you took me, isn't it? Did we yeah, go to Jeff? Right there. Yep, twenty one nautiloids on that layer. And uh, yeah, Dell and I looked at these vertical ones. We saw right. them like circles on the on the uh, deposit. And so one right. out of seven is vertical. And then uh, if you think about it, there's some kind of preferred orientation there. They're not randomly aligned like they fell to the bottom of the ocean and kind of died a slow death and... Uh, uh, just fell randomly on the sedimentation surface. We have all this evidence of orientation pattern. When you have large numbers of nautiloids, you can get their orientations by the pointy end, and you'll find out that there's not a lot of nautiloids pointing in the southwest uh, direction at Marble Canyon in eastern Grand Canyon. And that argues that the flow direction is to the southwest. Mm -hmm. And it's a westerly flow direction in the Lake Mead area around Garden Wash, where I measured 125 horizontal nautiloids, 27 vertical nautiloids. And you see horizontal and vertical nautiloids, and it's a quadrupolar pattern, orientation pattern. When you have large numbers of nautiloid data, you can test for randomness. And this is no random orientation. This is strong statistics argues for some type of flow orientation. Uh, vertical, one orientation. And then you see transverse to flow, two orientations there. And then they're like the pointy end points into, can point into the current. And so you see this evidence of uh, apical orientation of nautiloids. Now, isn't that interesting? And, uh, you know, one out of seven on the average are vertical. That is, and they're in the middle of the bed, <laughs> not in the top or the bottom. And uh, as you look, study nautiloids, I, I found this one in Nautiloid Canyon. It's, uh, it's a crushed nautiloid. And I drew a picture of how it's crushed. And we know what the shell normally looks like, but the the shell has been crushed and it's been crushed so interestingly that it causes us to understand that the shell was crushed by implosion. You know what implosion is? The, the, the gas inside the shell was squeezed and it collapsed mm -hmm. and the whole shell was shortened horizontally and vertically by the implosion process. And here's an imploded nautiloid. And what does that argue? That argues that the body, there was gas chambers that were imploded. The body cavity had to be filled, therefore rapid kill and burial. 
Mm -hmm. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. So imploded nautiloid argues for uh, rapid burial and bodies in the in the chambers, in the living chambers of the shell. In other words, a mass kill. Mm -hmm. And then the log normal size distribution indicates a mass kill of entire life assemblage. Uh, I measured the maximum diameters of the shells. Here they are, the maximum shell diameters. And about the average is, uh, you know, uh, the mean is about uh, 9.6 centimeters. And it's a log normal size distribution, which if you know about population uh, sizes, that's uh, typical of a growth situation of a living assemblage of organisms like nautiloids. There's a lot of uh, middle age organisms. There's some really big ones and there's some really fine ones. In other words, you've got all the different sizes of nautiloids represented in the, in the population, which is also another evidence of mass kill of an entire life assemblage of nautiloids. Yeah. And uh, the log normal distribution, uh, there's a lot here to be explained, but it has to do with the crushing of the shells. And there's, there's a lot of detail here worth uh, talking about some other time. So it looks like we got a big problem. <laughs> I, know was gonna, a, I was going to yeah. ask this because the, when you were talking about all of this uh, large debris, uh, you would think that that would be evenly distributed uh, throughout that stratum, but it's not. You were saying it's concentrated in the center. Why is that? Isn't that in, well? Okay. <laughs> now that's not an interest. That's not an easy thing to explain, is it? And it's not intuitively obvious. If it fell to the bottom, you know, the coral heads might be explainable easily by some sedimentary process or if they're at the top, something, but why in the middle? Okay, and why are all those uh, fluid escape pipes there? And so that coarse texture in the middle of the bed and the, the coarsening upward texture and then the fining upward texture at the top of the bed with all of that coarse stuff right in the middle, that is uh, the big problem. And so there it is in the diagram, the, the middle of the bed has the coarse fossils and the fluid escape pipes get especially concentrated in the middle. And then at the top of the bed, those uh, fluid escape pipes are there. So um, that's the kind of thing that gets a physical process geologist thinking. And so I did some sand flow experiments with my son um, very good thing to do with your son is go to the park and play in the sandbox. And this happened February 3rd, the year 2000, Harry Griffin Park in uh, La Mesa, California. We did the sand flow experiments. And uh, it's in the giant sandbox at Harry Griffin Park that uh, the memorable event occurred. We started pouring sand, and you notice how sand makes piles when mm -hmm. it poured. And it's because of friction between the grains, and it makes a 30-degree sloping pile. And uh, isn't that interesting? And then I thought, what? We started throwing sand. We started throwing sand, not making sand piles. And as we did the sand piling and sand throwing experiment, um, my son and I imagined a world without granular friction. Let's call it no friction land. Sand would not form piles, but it would form in horizontal sheets. Without friction between grains, the grains would bounce along or shear in horizontal mm -hmm. sheets. Do you see what I was thinking at the time? Yeah. <laughs> and this led to the thought of what? 
a sandy debris flow that was very concentrated in sand and sediment, freighting up the large coral heads and the nautiloids, allowing them to be deposited in the center of the debris flow. Do you see how I kind of thought about that? Right. And uh, so it's just thinking about it. And uh, well, I, I had some things that reminded me of uh, Dell. You'll be you'll be com you'll be comforted to know that some of the things I've learned at Mount St. Helens helped me understand granular oh. flow. And uh, I was reading in a in a, a geology journal uh, an article by George Potsma on large floating class and turbidites, where he made a a tank study and he dropped. Uh, a clamshell hopper with a ton of sediment in it, and he got uh, large objects to float in the center. Hmm. And then, of course, uh, I had the uh, the sand flow uh, box right. experience. But combining those thoughts about the pyroclastic flows and the mud flows at Mount St. Helens with the floating class in turbidites and with the uh, grain flow in the sandbox, that led to my understanding of this idea about the sandy debris flow on the ocean floor on a very uh, look very low slope with uh, a fast moving slurry of uh, grains. And that grain slurry model is what I kind of worked with. I was thinking about this and um, it came to my attention a paper about from a engineer about how debris flow should operate. It wasn't in the geologic literature. It was in the engineering literature that uh, I learned about how to one degree model what I was thinking in the sandbox. And I was thinking about the, the combined ideas and I learned how to do a one dimensional uh, flow model for the uh, 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 Sandy debris flow using Cranenberg equations, the 1D model. You know, the dynamic pressure of flow is has to be equal to the stat difference of the static pressure in front of the flow and the static pressure inside the flow. For a stable, non-accelerating flow, they, uh, the, the pressures have to balance. And because of that, I was able to 1D solve this thing, uh, assuming very little friction in no friction land, about six meters per second or 20 feet per second, a flow velocity. Think about that, 20 hmm. feet per second flow velocity. Hmm. This thing could be stable. That's what the 1D model suggested. So the sandy gravity current could explain the coarse, lay, uh, coarse material in the center of the bed. So I gave it to a uh, computational fluid dynamicist. I can do 1D modeling using algebraic equations, but I was interested in doing uh, the computer model 2D. And I gave it to Clarence Berg, a computational fluid dynamicist by training, and he modeled the debris flow in 2D using uh, his uh, computational fluid dynamics code. And uh, I remember him giving them a problem, and then I was uh, a, a month or so later, I called him on the phone and I asked him, hey, how are you doing with that computational fluid dynamics problem of the fast moving, you know, uh, 20 foot per second debris flow? How, how's, it, how's it going? And you know what he said? The first thing he said, wow, they fly. And he emphasized the word fly. He, he said it uh, very uh, emphatically. With, with a lot of emphasis. And here's the pressure diagram around the, the, the debris flow that he modeled. And look at this, it's a wing. And he said, mm -hmm. they fly. 
Isn't that cool? And what's that? Low pressure over the top of the wing and the high pressure in front of the wing. And then he said, hey, look at this. There's a hydroplane surface underneath. It's flying off the substrate. Hmm. And uh, so it's essentially a frictionless flow over mm -hmm. a horizontal surface. Hmm. And, and so it looks a lot looks a lot like a like an airplane wing. Uh, and in a in the in the airplane wing would have the same kind of low pressure on top, high pressure in front. Yeah. And uh, low pressure behind and some other things. And so wow, what is uh, that is really encouraging. So here's what I did. I had a friend who um, the friend uh, is a modeler, sedimentary modeler. His name is Jeff Marr. And I had him model this flow in a large tank at St. Anthony Falls Research Laboratory in uh, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And you see the carpet of the of the basin and he dropped a ton of slurry on that carpet in the middle of the tank and watched it flow. Now, if I push the button, you can see the movie he made and don't blink. Okay. Because uh, it happens very rapidly. Okay. Here goes. I'll push this button and see what happens. Okay. I'll play it to you one more time in real time. Here you go again. Wow. Zips right through. Very fast uh, flow over the bottom of the tank. Now I'm going to slow it down. Here it is slowed down. Isn't that amazing? It behaves as a cohesive or coherent body. And then at the end, in the wake of the debris flow, it's turbulent. It's laminar in front and turbulent in back. And uh, boy, that's interesting, isn't it? Hmm. So the, the fluid modeling shows that such things are possible and lends credence to the idea that uh, 25 cubic miles of sediment slurry was launched over the sea floor. Mm -hmm. And here's my sedimentary model. Okay, and that's what sediment sedimentary process geologists are supposed to do. We're supposed to model. So there's the debris flow. It's 25 cubic miles in uh, maybe 200 miles long, 25 cubic, uh, tw 25 cubic miles in volume. At the head of it, it has a a hydroplaning flow boundary. The only thin bed that can exist is in the very sharp boundary uh, with shear, shear largely combined to the hydroplane. And so nothing can be deposited down there, essentially nothing. And then of course, the velocity is very high, um, 20 meters or 20 feet per second, 20 feet per second, the velocity of the slurry and then the high concentration of the slurry as it's flowing over the bed. So basically nothing happens in front, but in the tail of the current is what where things get really interesting. And uh, in the tail of the turbulence, all of that velocity turbulence is created and the concentrations increasing as you go down and it increases in a curved way and there's no sharp rheological boundary between the bed and the flow and so there's a quick bed a, a transition zone between se compacted sediment and uh, flow and so that leads to this zone where large objects like coral head and nautiloids can fall mm -hmm. and that flow boundary zone has low shear and that's why the nautiloids can fall in there in vertical orientation. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. Uh, and it explains the fluid escape pipes. The fluid escape pipes are the, the fluid is escaping out of that quick bed, that partially consolidated sediment. 
as it's accumulating so rapidly. And uh, so that explains the nautiloid bed. Okay, and now you've got my uh, my model for the, the nautiloid bed. Hmm. So Steve, those, uh, those uh, fluid pipes, those release pipes, are those caused because uh, there's water uh, concentrated in there, and then as it um, as it Come gets out. compressed, that water is is forced up. Is that what's happening? Yeah, right. So, and that's what I saw in the pyroclastic flows and the mud flows at Mount St. Helens. Is they they congeal oh. so rapidly that um, the fluid couldn't be squeezed out very quickly. And so it continued to dewater as it uh, accumulated, essentially. Mm -hmm. How do we make thick strata sequences quickly? Submarine, buoyantly supported, sandy, gravity current. Sandy, it's 50% by volume sediment. It's liquefied. In other words, it has poor fluid, it's pressurized, that poorly leaks out and it's, uh, it has viscosity in the, the pore fluid. And it's laminar flow, not turbulent, and it's hydroplaning, essentially on a frictionless substrate, and it generates lift. In other words, it's wing shape. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, you, you've got a pretty good sedimentary model that explains the, the extremely persistent uh, layer in the Grand Canyon and off to the oh. west. And it's, yeah. it's some type of uh, high concentration debris flow. And uh, that, uh, that's the wonder of thinking about this. So Steve, I, I mean, you've got the slide up here, but obviously what you've been talking about is radically different uh, than the, the standard, um, the standard, uh, scientific paradigm that would say all the sediment is just coming down in a placid ocean uh you're talking about no it wasn't uh sediment dropping down over millions of years you're talking about a rapid uh underwater mud flow that is basically screaming <laughs> across the bottom uh so that just that just sounds to me like there are a whole lot of implications associated with what this research tells us, what are they? Yeah, uh, th there's all kinds of implications to, th to think about. Okay, uh, uh, what? how about those overlying limestone rhythmites, the chert, uh, mm -hmm. waxstone, limestone rhythmites above the nautiloid bed? Could those be the recoil from the giant tsunami that would be generated as 25 cubic miles of sediment goes shooting through the ocean. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Something to think about, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So the, the fine sediment overlaying the nautiloid bed could be the disturbance deposit created hmm. in the recoil to the flow. <laughs> And then, of course, the implication that Derry was dealing with, how does the debris flow end? And uh, Derry, you want to take a few of this uh, these subjects? Yeah, I'd be happy to. When we first started looking at the debris flow and defining the hydrodynamics of it, uh, we used the Cranenberg equations, as Dr. Austin mentioned. And we, we built a lot of spreadsheets. This was back in 2002, 2003. And we were trying to really understand the flow dynamics of how, how the flow was moving, how deep was the water it was in, and what were the characteristics of the flow. Um, in 2004, we had our hands on a, a 1D model from another university. And we thought, well, let's see if we put in the parameters into this. Um, it was a computational model, uh, see what the flow did as it continued to move down slope. And the model sort of blew up. We had a supersonic flow 
uh, running underwater, which is probably not realistic going faster than the speed of sound. So that's when uh, Dr. Austin engaged the 2D modeler to get uh, a little better model for us. But what we found was as the flow continued to move westward, it thickened. And then at some point, it had this wing shape to it that was hydroplaning. And you can kind of envision it. Uh, Dr. Austin calls it something like a train wreck. But at some point, that wing either lifted off the ground and slammed into a wall of water, or it just completely inflated with water and it turned into a whole bunch of different flow regimes. So the flow went from this steady state, seven foot uh, thick flow, and then transitioned into a number of different flows. When we were looking at that little video of the flow that was done in the flume experiment, you could actually see two flows. The first, first flow goes by and then real quick after it, a second flow followed it. And we call that flow head decapitation. And so as we went further west into Nevada, not only did we see the uh, flow thickening and forming dunes, and the only thing that, well, there are dunes that are similar to that, that are formed by high-speed water uh, under Golden Gate uh, Bridge in San Francisco, for example. So we, we see a type of those dunes and know the speed of the water and, and the height, and we can do all that measurement. So we're seeing that type of a flow transition into attractive current forming uh, sand dunes. And then we also see this flow head decapitation uh, a little bit north of where those dunes were. We found where two flows had gone one over the other and the flow transformation changed from what we call a hyper concentrated flow where we have the fluid escape tubes to a concentrated flow. And all of the, the big particles are at the top so the pressure is is high at the bottom and it pushes the big particles at the top uh, flume experiments have also shown similar uh, type of interactions where this the flow gets going so fast it, it breaks down and sort of fingers out into multiple different types of flows so it wasn't a simple flow transformation and and just pile up into a, a stack of debris, it actually broke apart into multiple different types of flows. And I think one of the questions as we were sort of discovering all of this was uh, Dr. Austin asked, do you believe in reincarnation? And we were, we were actually seeing where the flow would disintegrate and then reform again into these hyper-concentrated flows with well-defined well -defined flow heads. And mm -hmm. so the, the deposits that remained varied from just thicker beds to sand dunes to uh, overlying flow heads, one over the top of the other. Um, and so it ends in a very chaotic mess, of all types of flow. Um, regimes when the flow ends as it picks up speed and goes down slope lots of things happen and it's it's it doesn't it's not like it's tens or hundreds of miles difference between one flow regime to another they could be literally a mile down the road you have a completely different flow regime at the end of the flow it was amazing uh, uh, very very chaotic and very diverse. Um, yeah. So um, we don't know what the end of deposit is going to look like. <laughs> no. And because we haven't even got there yet. Okay. And how big is it? Is it bigger than 25 cubic miles? Okay. And uh, the, the other implication are do other nautiloid beds exist? Okay, we can ask because nautiloids are a, a fossil that has been found like in Arkansas and in Missouri. Um, could those uh, beds also be like this? 
And for example, Zach Klein, the producer of this podcast, he has found a non-laid bed in St. Louis, and he might want to talk about that after the conclusion. But uh, let's get to the conclusion. A geologist didn't expect to find it, did they? <laughs> no. Uh, absolutely not. Not in the wildest ideas. And, and what? Geologist views about geologic time have what? Uh, poisoned the understanding of uh, the, this type of process of mass flow. And so the extremely persistent stratum is real. Uh, and uh, it's 25 cubic miles in volume that we know of. The content of the stratum is amazing, especially the content of nautiloids, coral heads, and fluid escape pipes in the center of the bed. That, that's a mind challenger. And then, okay, we have a liquefied sediment flow model that seems to work. And that's rather comforting from the standpoint of we can uh, scientifically explain it. And then the implications, of course, are far reaching mm -hmm. and all different areas. And so what I'd like you to take away from the discussion uh, this evening is minutes, not millions of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, discussion of Redwall limestone fossil deposit leads to the understanding of uh, limestone that's tremendously relevant to the creation evolution controversy and the idea of a global flood forming the strata record of the earth. Minutes. Mm -hmm not millions of years. We're Zach, seeing what? other, oh, go ahead, Dill, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, Derry, you're on. I was just gonna mention that uh, in addition to what Zach's gonna talk about, we're continuing a study in the panhandle of Texas where we found another large sediment gravity flow that flowed from south to north and ends, it terminates at the, uh, Canadian River right at the Oklahoma border above Amarillo. And this has been historically interpreted as a, 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 an ancient soil because it's in the middle of rock that uh, it, it's un, unlike any of the surrounding rock and nobody has really understood how to interpret it other than a soil. But we see the exact same characteristics of a flow where large class are floating in the middle of the flow. We see fluid escape pipes. We see sort of a frothy layer on top where it's all the uh, sediment has dewatered from the, the water coming out of the flow as it's compacted. So we're in the process of reinterpreting what has been historically a, 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 an ancient soil, which could take thousands or uh, you know hundreds and thousands of years to make uh, into a, a, another sediment gravity flow that would have happened in, in hours as opposed to thousands of years. So that's some of the ongoing research. And then I know um, Zach has some as well. Yeah. Now, Zach, I'd be interested in hearing what you have found as well. Yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, thank you for the, the opportunity. Um, I'm a so just so folks know for context, I'm actually an ambassador for Logos Research Associates. And my my job here is to run this live stream. So you, you don't, normally don't see me very often unless something goes wrong. Um, but uh, while I work in technology, my passion is uh, geology. And so I'll just share this really briefly here. Um, so uh, in learning about the geology of my local area, I live in St. Louis, Missouri, on the Missouri-Illinois border. And uh, in just learning some of the, the local stratigraphy, trying to understand the geology of the region, I started coming across these orthocone, straight-shelled nautiloid fossils. And uh, I, I immediately, my mind went to uh, Dr. Austin's research. I had also been told by um, a, actually a, a colleague of Dr. Austin, uh, Dr. Kurt Wise, that he, who used to live in Illinois, uh, that he had discovered nautiloid fossils and nautiloid beds in Illinois, not far from where I live. And so based on that hunch, I started uh, tracing these guys and we found several more. Some of them are of, of uh, quite large size. Others are smaller. 
But right away, I began to see that there was uh, a pattern showing up. These guys tended to be oriented in similar directions. In some cases, they even seem to be imbricated, as we see this example, where they're stacked against each other, pointing in a sa- this, this, uh, roughly the same direction. Now, I need to stress, this is, we don't have a Grand Canyon, so I don't have the number of exposures uh, to work with. And so my data is still quite preliminary. But as I start plotting these out, I'm seeing what looks like preferential orientation. There seems to be uh, a they, they tend to be oriented uh, with uh, and I'm still working on uh, fine tuning this data. And of course, gathering more gathering more uh, measurements. But we are seeing what seem, what looks similar to a quadrupolar uh, distribution. I'm sure this diagram will be filled out as we find more more fossils. But similar uh, to what Dr. Austin described. Uh, this bed that contains the fossils, it's a single bed within a formation called the Kimswick Formation. It's an agrilicious uh, limestone deposit. And this bed is quite persistent. Uh, I've been able to follow it for at least well over 100 uh, kilometers. Um, and it's I can correlate it with this shaley K bentonite that lies right underneath. So if you see my cursor there, this is actually an, an Ordovician volcanic ash deposit. And the bed that contains the fossils is immediately on top of this shaley bentonite layer. Um, and I've found almost no nautiloid fossils anywhere else in the formation, at least so far. Uh, so this is one location where we first began uh, doing the, the, re- the field work. Here's a second location, a little more weathered. This is um, about uh, 150 kilometers from where the original location. Um, and we're finding nautiloids there as well. And we're finding uh, that the stratigraphy, the the particular bed form, uh, which is underlined by uh, this decor group, which is uh, sort of a, a more thinly bedded limestone and shale unit, we're seeing very similar uh, features in the stratigraphy, which makes me think that this is a persistent uh, layer that continues for some time. And so uh, if I go back to the map here, that lower red dot, that's where we first discovered them. And we've gotten as far as Frankfurt. Uh, to the north, and we found multiple locations in the St. Louis area, south of the city. So very preliminary, but uh, very exciting as well. Hmm. Well, thank you, Zach. Uh, what this implies to me, and, and uh, Dr. Austin, I'm going to ask you uh, this question, that um, if we're talking about these mud flows that are occurring uh, as, a, as a result of the flood, I, I'm, I'm assuming that we haven't mentioned that specifically, but the, they're, they're occurring uh, during the flood that we would not be surprised to find that we have various mud flows uh, that, uh, as, as Zach just showed, that we might find these same kinds of mud flows in, in numerous places around the world. Isn't that uh, interesting? the implications of one thing that helps explain other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, so that we have far reaching implications, don't we? And, uh, and uh, so uh, we need a new generation of uh, creation researchers uh, with, uh, with a flow dynamics, understanding uh, sedimentary modeling to, uh, help understand these things because uh, uh, geologists aren't expecting to find these kind of things, are they? Right, <laughs> no, right. yeah. Okay, um, Dr. Austin, we do have a couple questions here and I've, I've got a couple for you as well. Uh, th- uh, this is from Joel. He, this is the question that he asked, have you been able to model uh, the fossil sorting such that a flow like this would be void of fossils at the leading edge and in the metal and at the trailing edge, is this still theoretical? Um, if uh, if fossils are carried in the head of the flow, they're carried in laminar uh, flow that, and there's no velocity gradient. So they can be just large sedimentary objects, but there's no tendency for them to fall or to float. So they're just gonna leave. Okay, it's only the tail of the flow that allows the large objects and and the the coral heads and the nautiloids to accumulate. And that's uh, 
the, the, the wonderful thing about it is the, the front of the flow, uh, the, the streaming uh, uh, 20 feet per second flow isn't going to make anything. It's on a hydroplane. And uh, so uh, whatever it takes with it, it deposits elsewhere. But the, the nautiloids that were in the top of the flow that were spun off either by killing uh, in the water column or swept in by the turbulence in the wake of the, f of the passage of 25 cubic miles of sediment, uh, that would be uh, lethal, wouldn't it? Okay, and they would fall on that surface. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, that's the way I'm thinking about it. Yeah. As we headed west, uh, once we see the flow start to inflate at Virgin River Gorge, we start to lose uh, nautiloid fossils in any great number and the large football sized coral fossils as well. A lot of crinoid fossils and bivalve or clam type fossils are carried along in the flow. But once it turns into a, a more attractive flow where there's uh, more friction um, and it ingests more water into the flow, which causes it to also turbulent, fit. causes turbulence, causes turbulence. We see most of the large fossils are no longer present. Uh, lots and lots, uh, uh, trillions of small fossils in, in crinoids and bivalves, but none of the larger fossils that we see back on the platform faces mm. of the flow. So we do know that that those large nautiloids and large corals are not carried on into the end of the flow uh, that we've studied so far. They do stop. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a there's a follow-on to that. Uh, I'll read this. I'll read this to you. Uh, evidently, nautiloids were very abundant in the pre-flood world. They theoretically could have survived the flood. What happened to them? What are your thoughts? Okay. Uh, well, they obviously did survive the flood. We have living nautiloids, uh, coiled nautiloids today. But the, the straight-shelled or uh, orthocone nautiloids, uh, they're, they're extinct as far as we know. And, uh, okay. the, uh, the, but um, this... Um, these nautiloids were very abundant and the, the ones in the immediate area of these huge high concentration slurries, like 25 cubic miles of slurry passing uh, uh, through, um, that's the, just the overpressure from that would, I think, uh, uh, cause all kinds of crushing of the shells. And uh, so it's it's amazing that we even have uh, uh, nautiloids that uh, serve, you know, shells that survive, even though it'd be yeah. lethal to the, all the animals in the local area. Right. And you do and, see and coiled ahead, nautiloids. Uh, some of the largest pictures of coiled nautiloids I've seen are from the Himalayan mountains that they bring down from the top. And they clearly were buried. Uh, and deposited and then raised up with the mountain right. orogeny as those occurred. So uh, a lot of them would have been buried by this rapid sedimentation that would have occurred during uh, Noah's flood. And, and I've seen one coiled nautiloid in uh, the Whitmore nautiloid bed in Marble Canyon out to the extreme mm -hmm. east. Uh -huh. So uh, there are coiled nautiloids in the nautiloid bed. Uh, mm -hmm. I've seen them, but yeah. they're rare, rather rare for some reason. And if these were, uh, these are bottom dwelling creatures, bottom feeding creatures, uh, then uh, they were at a very high risk area <laughs> from, from the mud flows. And so uh, it is, it's possible then I suppose that, that a lot of them were just wiped out in those mud flows. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, just another comment that came in, and then I, I've got a question uh, for you. Uh, I, I like this one because uh, uh, this comment says, "I'm hearing tonight we could we could use engineers 
with expertise in modeling fluid dynamic dynamics. Please. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay. you know, really that is, that is a consistent call, is it not, that you, you all have made uh, for young people. Uh, there is so much, so much uh, open for us to examine uh, that uh, people can get involved in many, many different ways. Yeah. So it's the engineers that helped us solve the problem. Uh, it wasn't geologists only. <laughs> in fact, mm -hmm. uh, if it wasn't for the engineers, I wouldn't had, I would not have had the the Cranenberg equations to 1D model to know that it's a a 20 foot per second flow velocity. Mm -hmm. And from that, I would have uh, not been able to, you know, so I, uh, I would not be able to say to the computational fluid dynamics person what the model parameters are. So uh, it was engineers that allowed me to talk to engineers about how to reverse engineer mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the, the, the Nautilite bed. Yeah. Well, I have uh, I have one uh, final question for you, uh, and it comes from the um, the experiment that was done. You showed the the slow motion of that uh, slurry that was uh, dropped uh, into that I don't know big water aquarium or something uh, that. Uh, and what was interesting to me was at the end of the flow. I mean, we were talking about. Uh, the transformation of the mud flow on the front end. Um, yes. Have we just, have we looked at? Has anyone be, been able to look at the the tail end, uh, which I guess would be the west end of of the of this flow? Yeah, east end. The tail is east, uh, east right? End. Yeah, it's the east yeah. End. Um, all we know is the deposits. Uh, we interpret them as the tail of the flow. And uh, with for good reason, we have uh, all of this engineering uh, uh, reasons to in interpret it that way. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, yeah. And uh, fortunately, we, we, we were able to anticipate um, what that was like. It, it's, it's comforting to have a flow model. And you see what a geologist is supposed to do? A geologist is supposed to give you a sedimentary model for how a layer formed, okay? And mm -hmm. so that's uh, that, uh, that's the relevance of the geologic uh, position. But uh, there wasn't a lot of geologic uh, uh, investigations uh, on this subject, were, were there? And right. uh, so... Uh, that, that's why the engineers uh, are the heroes of this plot. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Some of the engineering work was done for studying channel flow. When they're building, uh, you know, water runoff channels, that kind of thing. So a lot of engineering work done in that area is also applicable to what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Is, is there... Um... Is there just a thought here to help people uh, get in their mind an understanding of the source of these mud flows? Uh, that, that's a lot. I mean, you talk about a lot of material here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that started? Where did that? Where did all of that mud flow come from? Okay, we we have the flow orientation. We know the direction of the flow probably within 10 or 15 degrees, okay? And it obviously came from the north and from the east to the southwest and to the west, and it curved down a slope, essentially. And as it, mm -hmm. it did that, it had to come from somewhere, and it, it had to leave a big dent. See, see the implications here? The source area has to be missing <laughs> a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, the best part of geology is not finding and explaining what isn't there, okay? And, uh, but I think it came out of Colorado. I think it came out of Durango area. There's the Leadville limestone and the bottom of Leadville limestone, which is the red wall correlation uh, limestone, it's not there, 
Okay. And so I, uh, I've got two reasons to say it came out of Colorado, the flow direction indicated by the nautiloids themselves. And of course the, the, the base of the Leadville limestone in Colorado doesn't mm -hmm. appear to, uh, uh, to be anything sedimentary. So it obviously gave it sediment if it had it to, no. to Nevada and California, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Volunteered it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let me offer just a, a kind of closing comment from each of you, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap this up. Uh, let Derry go first. He's. <laughs> yeah. The the challenge of uh, following the flow out into Nevada and, and and into California, we spent a lot of time even in uh, uh, Death Valley looking for it uh, all over the place. I, I think the biggest surprise for me was the variability of what we saw towards the end. Even though we didn't see the actual end of the flow, uh, the variation of the flow characteristics as it went further uh, westward was very surprising. Uh, didn't expect to see that type of variability from location to location. And uh, fascinating. Okay, well, uh, let me do a final comment. 36 years I've been looking at this layer. <laughs> uh, is there anything else for me to do? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it's an endless uh, type of process. And uh, yeah, I love being a field geologist looking at these things. And uh, so if you find uh, some nautiloids, uh, spend some time looking at them. They can uh, lead to some rather challenging life experiences. <laughs> and of course, uh, it basically confirms the Bible, doesn't it? The biblical flood not mm -hmm. millions of years in geologic ages. Yeah. And uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's one of the take homes from this study. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me bring this to a close here. I want to thank uh, both of you, Dr. Austin, uh, Derry, uh, for this amazing look into these processes that were going on during the flood. I also want to thank you uh, for the, the professionalism, uh, the work, the detail that you have done uh, that uh, just shows us, I, I think, how science should be done. And I think within, within the proper framework and understanding uh, of the world around us and, and uh, God's word. So I want to encourage all of you to check out uh, the website for Logos Research Associates. There are a number of research efforts uh, that are underway. And you can look at those under the donate button to help uh, these incredible scientists do their work. This is the only way, uh, pretty much the only way that creation research, like what you saw from Dr. Austin today, uh, can be funded. It's, it's not a surprise that uh, they don't get government funding. And so I encourage you uh, to look at that, as well as viewing some of the other live stream broadcasts that are available to you on, on the website. Uh, let's thank the Lord for the time that we've had. Father, we are grateful as we uh, look at these things and understand the confirmation that we find in the world around us of what you have told us. Um, and in particular here, uh, to understand the, uh, the tremendous forces that were at play uh, when you brought judgment on the world. And uh, as we read in 1 Peter that uh, you destroyed the world once with water, and you're going to do it again uh, with fire. Father, help us uh, to be people who uh, are willing to look and to see the reality of the world around us. Uh, we pray, Father, for uh, anyone who has been watching here, that, uh, Lord, they might understand that your word can be trusted. Uh, it is true. And uh, we thank you for all of this. Everything that has been done here, Lord, we pray, would have been done for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you all for, for joining us uh, tonight. We'll see you next time right here on the Logos Research Associates live stream broadcast.